Good morning, everyone, and a big warm welcome to you all uh, today for our virtual roadshow event in partnership with Cyber Scotland, where we'll be covering the work we've done to date on cyber pathways and standards. Uh, just give you a quick run through um, of the event uh, today. Um, we have Simon Hepburn, the CEO of the UK Cybersecurity Council, who will be talking about um, our work in the council and giving a brief introduction to it. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome Kiara Mitchell, Cyber Cluster Manager of Scotland IS Cyber. And discussing cyber pathways, we have Amy Rogers um, from the UK Cybersecurity Council and Zeshan Satar from CompTIA. Discussing cyber standards, we have Paul Dawson Hart and Brian Lilly, both from the UK Cybersecurity Council. And following this, we'll be running a Q&A um, session. So any questions that you have from anything that you hear today from Simon, um, from Amy, from Paul or Brian, um, please do um, put them in the chat. Um, unfortunately, Kiara won't be able to stay for the Q&A session, but if you have questions that are specific for her and, and what you hear from her, please do um, let us know in the chat function. I'll compile the questions and um, send them on to her for a, a response. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, introduce Simon Hefburn, CEO of the UK Cybersecurity Council. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Pam. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. R really, really pleased to be here and uh, welcome everyone to, to our, our session with Scotland. What I'm going to be doing is a brief presentation in relation to our work uh, that we've been doing within the council. So a brief presentation uh, really leading up to obviously the, the work that both uh, Amy and Paul, Brian, etc. has been doing. Um, so I, won't, I don't want to steal their thunder. So it will be a whistle stop tour. So starting off with, I'll start off with really the kind of history and the background to the council, our core mission and the journey that we've been, been up to and, and basically bringing things up to date, going through our five pillars, then talking about our ecosystem partners and then the next steps. So the core part, of, I think, the background of the council was that back in the strategy of 2016 to 2021, there were specific references uh, within that strategy around the development uh, to develop and accredit the cybersecurity profession, and also to, to kind of develop an organisation that would be a focal point that can advise, shape and inform national policy. So that was really the kind of foundation of the organisation. Then in the UK uh, government national cyber skills strategy, there was again the specific reference around an independent body. So kind of moving on from the formation to an independent body. And that was obviously the kind of the starting of the formation of the UK Cyber Security Council. And, and one of his key aims and kind of views at that time was the definitely to kind of develop a framework of cybersecurity specialisms with alignment to appropriate career paths. So that was a kind of core aim. Then in 2019, the formation project was established. Uh, that was, uh, uh, so IET was uh, sponsored and supported by DCMS, uh, working with 10 organizations, uh, 15 organizations, sorry, uh, around the uh, kind of, around 10 different work streams. So everything from careers, uh, skills, standards, ethics, governance, et cetera. And that really, for my view, was the kind of formation of the organization. So really setting some of the foundations for which we've kind of built on since then. The key thing that came out of that was really what was going to be the key aim, kind of vision, mission of the organisation. And, and for us, it has really been about the focus of being the self-regulatory body of, of the cybersecurity profession, to be the voice of, of the profession. And my whole view on it is that to be the voice of the profession, you basically need to listen and hear. So we spend a lot of time talking, conversating, listening and really getting a view and getting a pulse of what's happening within the sector and within the profession. A key for, 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 for us is definitely to support the uh, UK national cyber strategy and to, to obviously to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. And especially with what's taking place global, I think that's absolutely essential. And it never key was to develop and promote the, the uh, steward and be the national stewards of recognised standards, obviously the career pathways. Part of our core journey, I think back in, so the formation project basically ended in March 2021. And at that point, uh, we were established as an independent entity, so as, as the council itself. Then in uh, July 2021, we were granted charitable status for the Charity Commission. Uh, in September, I was appointed as the CEO and we also opened our organisational membership. So that's been going really well. So thanks everyone to everyone who's joined us as organisational members, because that's really important to inform and assist us in the development of the profession. In November 21, uh, we were given uh, 
Royal Chartered, uh, obviously granted by the Queen. So where we are currently is that we've obviously went through Privy Council process to get the, the Royal Charter. I'm just waiting for the Great Seal before we can kind of make the more kind of formal announcements and actually started to run through the process of, you know, chartered cybersecurity professionals. Also in November 21, uh, we were, were there was a report that was written by KPMG uh, that was uh, commissioned by NCSC. Sorry about all the acronyms, but I know you know all the organisations. Uh, and within that, there was five key reports, uh, key recommendations that very much focused on how we can diversify um, the, the, the the profession. Within, within those recommendations, there were two recommendations, which was for the council to move forward, which we're really pleased to say we'll be doing. And we're appointing a member of staff to kind of drive our kind of outreach and diversity agenda moving forward. Then in December 21, as everyone knows, the national cyber strategy was launched. And we were a, a core component within that. And I'll just be highlighting some of the key areas that we'll be focused on as part of that strategy launch. In January, so earlier this year, I mean, we have been, from my view, working really co collectively and collaboratively with obviously DCMS as our core funder and NCSC as the technical authority. So we've had ongoing strategic meetings really as part of that collaboration and that, that kind of working together. And for me, that's important because I'm quite clear that for the organisation, we're very much focused on the extending and expanding. It's all about the, the kind of skills gap, the standards development, the careers route map, uh, and the technical authority is definitely in the NCSC. So actually working in close collaboration for us is, is absolutely essential. And then in February and March, uh, we've started our UK wide uh, roadshow. So both the consultation uh, elements working close with DCMS as part of that wider conversation and today's session, which is around standards and careers roadshow. So we're doing that with each of the nations because we are the UK Cyber Security Council, so it's important that we engage on a UK wide basis. It's really essential for us. Again, in, in February, we also launched our, our working groups for both standards, ethics and careers. And moving forward to kind of March and moving forward, we will be formally responding to the consultation uh, consultation document, uh, both on two levels. One, based on our organisational members, and there's a meeting that's been put in for that to take place, and also from the kind of my board, trustee board, and the executive uh, level, so that the consultation responses deadline on that's 20th of March. We'll also be doing a lot of work on our kind of thematic standards uh, development and our careers route map. So that's ongoing working with our working groups and the whole process we've basically developed. We'll be continuing with our UK wide roadshows and also we have uh, thematic events taking place. Uh, for example, International Women's Day on the 8th of March, the so next Tuesday. Uh, we have people including uh, Dr. Claudia Nathanson, the chair of the council and Lindy Cameron, CEO of NCSC. Uh, who will be basically keynote speakers at that event and also the london uh, symposium which is focused very much on fintech so fun, uh, financial technology and cyber taking place on the 10th of uh, march so next thursday so exactly a week away we're focused on working really i think on five key pillars so uh, professional standards, ethics, careers and learning, outreach and thought leadership and influence. And I think for each of those areas, you know, we've got specific work programmes that are taking place to develop those areas. Uh, within the, the kind of formation project, there was some of the foundation work that was carried on. But for us, it's about really building on those initial, initial building blocks and again, working and engaging with the wider sector to develop these areas further. I think what's really important, I think all of these are important from my, my perspective, but I do think the, the whole thing around professionalizing the profession and having standards, one set of standards that's recognized across organizations, institutions and different sectors is absolutely essential. And really being clear around the 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 careers and the how to join obviously this this sector as a as a career and what specific qualifications certifications lead to um spe you know specific areas including kind of pen testing security architecture etc having an understanding how to do that and what qualifications they're aligned to is really important and also there is a perception of that you need to be a I don't want to steal anyone's funder, but you need to be a, a, a you know computer programmer high up in IT, et cetera, to join the sector. When ultimately there's loads of different specialisms and really it's about making this a profession which people want to join. So doing the outreach for schools, colleges, universities and the general public to say this is a profession. One, there's a skills gap, but two, this is a profession we want people to join and we want people to make those kind of choices, even at, you know when you're going through school in year nine as part of your options to say this is a profession I would like to join, just like engineering, accountancy and law. And the thought leadership book piece is really important in the sense of ensuring the people who are engaging with us as an organisation so we can absolutely talk truth to power. Because it's really important that as we're developing, it's a new kind of sector and profession in comparison to some of the longer, longer term professions. So it's constantly changing, constantly renewing. So I'm really interested in hearing views, perspectives and ensuring that obviously government, government departments and policy makers are kind of hearing that. So I was being the conduit for that conversation. 
we're really pleased, I think, with the our kind of partners. So this is just some of the examples of who we've been engaging with over the last few months. Um, so again, working really close to NCSC in relation to the kind of the the uh, technical authority, te technical kind of lead, and working close partnership, DCMS, Tech UK, Cabinet Office. So you can see there's an, obviously all of the, the devolved administration, and that's that's really important because what we don't want to do is to develop either standards, ethics, careers, or develop the organisation on the basis that only benefits one nation or one sector or one department. Yeah, so so for us, you know, the reason we've got a membership uh, membership kind of proposition is for the importance of people to engage with us as an organisation to make sure we're reflecting what's happening within the charity sector, within SMEs, within the public sector. So this, in a sense, so there's that wider conversation. So as we're developing, it works for everyone. So that's really important. So really pleased to say we've got all of these organisations as key partners as as we drive the agenda forward. My my chair regularly says it's important we basically stay in our swim lane. So our swim lane within the strategy is pillar one, so the U the UK ecosystem, and again an objective two. So there's many objectives in there, but objective two. So very much focused on enhancing and expanding the nation's cyber skills at every level, including through a world class and diverse cyber security profession that inspires and equips future talent. So in a sense, all we're hanging everything onto that, which is really important. So we're really clear where we fit within. The strategy which pillar we basically sit in yes there's kind of other, other areas but ultimately we need to get the people into the profession to then in relation to the other four pillars so we can then enact and implement what we want to do as as a country and then my last point is really just to say that there is the consultation that is out at the moment so the embedded standards and pathways across cyber security profession uh, so that consultation is open at the moment um, that was obviously launched by dcms closing date is the 20th of march and i would just encourage people to comment share your opinion because that will then inform how we develop the sector then my final slide is just really say what we're doing as the next steps so we're, we're really it's really important for us really to align uh, our work obviously to the national cyber strategy focusing again on, on pillar one to devolve the professional standards and our career route maps so really to again it's about developing one set of standards that works across all the different sectors organizations and, and, and professionals uh, to form strategic alliances to support our objectives so that's again around the kind of ecosystem engage with the sector as part of our strategic developments so that's really focused on where we've got organizational members who've joined us and then part of our working groups and our committees so they're really helping us develop all of our kind of our propositions and our, our developments uh, to implement our chartered organization status um, so again one of the what we're looking at there is uh, three core levels of chartered principal and, and associate and uh, and developing what the kind of criteria are and the qualifications and certifications and experience at each of those three levels and to develop a fit for purpose organization to deliver on our mission so we've currently got uh, six roles that are available all the information on our website uh, and again it's and that's really about structuring the organization so we can deliver what we basically set out to do so hopefully that gives you, it's a whistle stop tour uh, for the work of us as an organisation. So I so say thank you for listening and obviously I'll be taking questions as part of the Q&A later. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. If you have any questions uh, for Simon on anything that you've uh, just heard, please feel free to submit them to us in the chat function and we'll put those questions to him for a response during our Q&A session shortly. Um, next, I'd like to um, introduce Kiara Mitchell, Cyber Cluster Manager from Scotland, IS Cyber. Welcome, Kiara. Morning. Thank you, Lisa. I'm delighted to be here supporting your um, consultation this morning as well. Um, so I have um, a number of slides. I'm, I'm hoping to. Yes, here we go. Here are slides. Perfect. I will also be doing a whistle stop tour. So um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, do get in touch um, through the chat or feel free to follow up with me directly um, and apologies that I won't be able to stay on. Um, so my name is Kira Mitchell. I am the Cluster Manager for Scotland Cyber Security Cluster. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you some of the some key initiatives that's happening in Scotland, but also want to emphasize, you know, how we're also playing a key role across the UK and working with great organizations like the UK Cyber Security Council. Um, so starting with the cluster, um, um, the Sc cluster Scotland and cyber, you know, we're really here to support the cybersecurity sector as a whole. And, um, you know, you, I won't read all the text out, but we, we, we focus on three main areas in particular, um, and that is the um, ecosystem development or community building. And um, so it's bringing the community together and, and making sure that the community is working well together to support themselves um, as well. There's the skills side, so working with businesses and, um, and to make sure that we know we're, we're promoting cybersecurity as a very um, 
diverse and inclusive um, sector that people can access at any point in their careers um, and that we're having sufficient pipeline to support the businesses um, throughout um, in Scotland and throughout the UK. Um, and then finally, it's the innovation and growth. So really trying to support the sector um, and that can be to supporting spin outs, startups, scale ups, um, you know, established SMEs, but also encouraging more and more companies to open up offices and, and have a presence in Scotland as well. So so it's really trying to drive the overall um, sectorial growth in Scotland. Um, and you'll see the UKC tree logo there as well. And um, Simon had that on his slides. And um, Scotland and Cyber were one of the um, founding um, clusters to help um, set up UKC tree, working very closely with DCMS. Um, and I'm, you know, have the privilege to be on the board of that. So helping to kind of um, drive the board um, UKC tree that was set up um, this year. So we're not, we're not even a year um, established. So hopefully you'll see much more from us um, as things go forward. So I also wanted to mention Cyber Scotland Partnership. Um, that's um, a real, another way we're trying to make sure we've got better coordination and um, 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 collaboration within Scotland. So um, Cyber Scotland government, we're finding they were working with a number of different delivery partners, but we weren't always really fully aware of what each other were doing. So Skype, Skype, Cyber Scotland Partnership brings us um, delivery partners together, making sure that we're working much better together, that we're coordinating and we're collaborating and, and therefore helping to uh, deliver the Cyber um, Scot um, government strategic framework um, uh, in, a, in a more effective and efficient way. Um, and also it means that people have a much um, simpler way of finding information. So if you're not already receiving the Cyber Scotland Bulletin um, or you know familiar with the website, you know, I would encourage you all to go on there in terms of any um, 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 current information or any information that can support businesses throughout Scotland, um, it's a good place to go. Um, and obviously as part of that, we work really closely with the NCSC who are one of the partners. So this is not in any way Scotland trying to do their own thing. Um, everything we do um, as Scottish government are very, very keen to make sure that it's part of the wider UK cyber community and, and they have very strong partners with NCSC, GCHQ and, 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 and beyond. So, so we're just trying to um, complement what is going out on um, throughout the UK and trying to make it, I guess, more relevant and more accessible to, to some of the Scottish businesses um, um, you know, operating in, in, uh, in Scotland. Um, we are celebrating our anniversary. Um, just this year was launched um, Cyber Scotland Week last year. So this is just a very quick flash of things we've achieved over the year as part of the Cyber Scotland Partnership. Um, so we've got, you know, 22K in the portal. We've got a bulletin that's gone out, which with the readership is growing all the time. Um, and there's been just lots and lots of, um, you know, key information that's been dissemin disseminated throughout the year. So as I say, I would encourage you all to um, to become familiar with that website, if not already. Um, to do so. And you can see our partners there. So it's quite a diverse set. Um, Scottish Business Resilience Centre in particular would be one of the key partners driving the bulletin, driving the information that's going out there. Um, and then as part of that, we've got Cyber Scotland Week, and that's where Scotland is. Through our, through the, you know, where Scotland is as one of the partners. We've played a real active role in driving Cyber Scotland Week. So it's one of my colleagues, Amy Lee Davis, who has been the, you know, really the spearheading that whole program of, of events. So um, if any uh, any of you actually hosted the event, you're probably very familiar with Amy Lou at this stage. Um, but hopefully um, everyone's been uh, had an opportunity to get involved with Cyber Scotland Week. And even the fact you're on this event means you are um, already part of Cyber Scotland Week. So great to have this event running running during this week. Um, and really the aim of Cyber Scotland Week is just to try and you know, promote cyber security in, in, in a way that we, we can't do every 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 um every week of the year. And particularly we're trying to access um, individuals and businesses who maybe aren't thinking cybersecurity um, as much as they should and could be and it's just trying to encourage them to to take time out to, to learn to, to you know bring some insights back to their businesses and really try to make sure everybody is is you know considering cybersecurity and, and uh, um, progressing on that you know cyber maturity journey that we all need them to to continue on with um, and, and, and and you know throughout the week there's lots of really um, insightful and informative talks, you know, that were free and accessible to, to everybody. So yeah, we've had great, a great take up and great, um, great, uh, and it's great to see so many um, events back in person as well. So it's been a, you know, a real um, pleasure to get out and about and to meet so many people throughout the week as well. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly highlight, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, again, we can more than happy to send the slides after us, but you know, there is a lot of um, activity happening in cybersecurity in Scotland. And a lot of that has come on the back of the cyber resilience framework the Scottish government launched a year ago, and um, but, but obviously a lot of this will also be tied into the um, the the, UK, the national strategy that, that Simon uh, mentioned um, earlier as well. I'll, I'll I'll just touch on one in particular, which is the um, bottom right hand corner. So just this week, um, there was an announcement of um, SC3 being set up. So it's the Scotland Cyber Coordination Centre. Um, and that's um, and they're already you know looking for you know a, a, um, a couple of um, resources to support the centre. 
Um, and really, again, this is very much done in partnership with NCSC. We're looking to complement what they, they offer in the services they score um, today. But it's, it's just on the back of the CEPA attack, it was recognised that, you know, we really need to have a means of very quickly coordinating a, a group of key individuals to support national um, attacks and, and certainly any, you know, any critical national infra infrastructure attacks. Should should they happen, fingers crossed they won't. But, you know, it's, it's just to, to have the extra coordination ready to go should, should they happen. And really, that's what... SC3 will be looking to do um, absolutely complementing what NCSC do today, but having those feet in the ground to quickly um, react and deal with um, national um, uh, na national um, attacks and national breaches that we have um, have to have to um, have to deal with, and really focusing on um, areas like area notification, exercising, and incident management. So looking forward to see how that goes. Um, just a quick mention to Cyber Court as well. I had the real privilege of getting a tour of that on Wednesday. So that's going to be opening in the next couple of months. And within that, the NHS Scotland, they're going to have their Centre of Excellence. So quite a lot happening um, up in Dundee. So we're hoping that will be, you know, we're expecting that to become a real hub of cyber activity uh, and a real home for the community as well, which will be great to have. Um, um, I'm conscious that I am um, um, getting a shorter time in the next few minutes. So just a quick flip, run through the next few slides. This is really just to highlight that as, as the work we do in the cluster, we are working right across the cyber ecosystem. So not only working with cyber companies, large and small, um, both Scottish and international companies, you know, we work through the Scott, um, Cyber Scotland partnership with a number of the organisations supporting and delivering um, services on behalf of Scottish government and Scottish enterprise. And of course, we'll work with um, uh, across with the universities and colleges as well to make sure we're we're um, including academia in that. And through our work in the um, skills, we'll be working with many, many schools as well. For example, um, within Scotland is we run ePlacement Scotland. So it's really trying to help graduates to get um, um, some work experience before they actually graduate from universities. Um, and we're also um, having uh, running a program where we're getting mentors to go into schools. So that's more uh, mentors crossing both computer science and cyber, but finding individuals who can um, help support their the school staff so that they um, are comfortable um, um, tackling some you know current um, topics uh, relating to computer science and to and to cyber as well um, and and it's great to see the the community grow year and year we have around about 260 um, cyber companies with a presence in Scotland today and we're seeing that grow and um, grow more and more um, each, each year as well oh, sorry um, and I just wanted to quickly touch on on the academic side. So, you know, I mentioned that we have um, quite, an, you know, we work with the universities. We have uh, more and more universities, you know, offering more, more diverse range of courses all the time. You'll see on the right hand side some of the accolades that we've got. So I think we're still the only fully certified degree course, NCSC degree course, which is at Edinburgh, Edinburgh Napier. We've got a Centre of Excellence um, in Cybersecurity Research at Edinburgh University. And we've got two um, universities recognised for cybersecurity education. So it's great to see those um, those accolades. And again, they are going year and year um, as well. Um, and in Scotland, you know, you can study um, cybersecurity in school. So it's great that we, you know, we've got a strong um, career path or that you know strong route into that cybersecurity career path from quite an early stage. Um, but there, but there is options to move into it at any stage. You know, we've got fully funded graduate apprentices as well, so people can take that on while while in, in cybersecurity career. So again, if you're not familiar with the fact that we have these fully funded graduate apprentices, do do get in touch and more than happy to, to send out that information. But there's lots of ways for people to continue the cybersecurity education, as I say, at any stage in their in their career path. Um, Perfect. And then really just to highlight a couple of the areas that we um, we work in as part of the cluster. So, um, you know, I, I, I've touched on some of these um, already, but it's really about community building, making sure we're bringing the community together and um, so getting the community to work well together so they are supporting um, each other. And, and also as part of that, really trying to engage with the initiatives that are happening across the UK. So a key part of our role is that kind of signposting and disseminate, dissemination of information. So whether it's, it's promoting and highlighting consultations and events like, like we're, we're on just now, um, but also the, the many programmes that DCMS are um, are supporting, whether it's Cyber Runway, um, the NCSC for Startups, etc. all those programmes is making sure that we're really promoting and highlighting them to the Scottish community so they're, they're not missing out on opportunities um, that's happening throughout, throughout the UK. Um, one of the projects we're working on at the moment, just as an example, is a to establish a Scottish cyber innovation hub. So again, that'd be very much working in partnership with the likes of, of, of Plexel um, and others to, to have a, a hub and a home here that we can um, um, support our spin outs and our scale ups without needing to, to relocate to, to Cheltenham or to, to London. So hopefully uh, that's still ongoing work, but hopefully that's something we'll manage to, to pull off at some stage. So, so watch this space. 
And then I just wanted to quickly touch on another area that we feel is, is key as part of this um, collaboration that we talk about, and that's really this cross-sector focus. So um, we spend a lot of time, you know, getting to know the other clusters and the other really key sectors in Scotland and making sure that we can connect the cyber community with them. And there's, there's, there's a number of benefits from doing that. You know, one obviously is access to markets. A number of the cyber companies would, would love to start, you know, um, uh, finding customers to, to the, the FinTech Scotland or to um, digital health, for example, both two really growing sectors throughout the UK. Um, but equally for us, it's trying to introduce the cyber sector to these, um, to these sectors and to these organizations um, so that we can make sure that you know cyber security is at the forefront for any new initiatives or any projects or even you know encouraging them all to run events through cyber scotland week so we're, we're making sure we're talking about cyber security to to each of their sectors as well and um, because it's really you know as we all know it's really um key that we um consider cyber security from the forefront or as early as possible as we can um, in in any new emerging sector, you know whether it's IoT or national manufacturing, you know everyone's going towards this digital transformation, um, and the more we can kind of keep um, um, keep cyber security, you know, on the on the on the conversation, on the you know on the forefront of people's minds, the, the better really. So we see that as being a part of all. It's just continuing to beat that drum of of cyber security and, and not not let it be an afterthought for you know any of these sectors. So it's something that we're we're um, very focused on within the uh, within the cluster in Scotland. Um, and then, and that's it. That's it for me, really. Um, that was actually faster than I was expecting. So obviously, left out um, lots of things along the way. So do reach out um, if there is any uh, questions from anybody or anything else you'd like to, to know about. Um, and um, I hope you've all had an amazing Cyber um, Cyber um, Scotland Week, um, and you know that you you get a lot out of this session as well. Thank you for, for uh, participating. And that's me, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kira. It's lovely to have you uh, here today. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Amy Rogers from the UK Cybersecurity Council and Zeshan Sattar from CompTIA, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about the work we currently be doing in Cyber Pathways. Welcome, Amy and Zeshan. Good morning. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's just uh, get started. Uh, Amy, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Amy Rogers and I was the project work stream leader for the qualifications and careers section of the Council's formation group. And my background is in vocational education product development. And um, I'm going to take you through the learning journey so far. But first, I'm going to let Zishan introduce himself. Hi, hi everyone, my name is Zishan, Zishan Sattar. I'm the Director of Learning Skills Certification at CompTIA here in the UK. Um, and wow, I'm just trying to figure out when I go into tech and cyber learning, quite quite too many years I would care to admit towards. And yes, in terms of um, cyber careers and learning and education, uh, I worked on various programs and projects to get uh, people reskilled, upskilled and inspire the next generation to choose a career in cybersecurity. And with the council formation project, I uh, come to uh, led the work stream to uh, get the different groups together to finally uh, get the frameworks that we're going to uh, talk about this morning uh, at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve uh, at the moment, it's still a journey and I'm sure yeah, you're going to have lots of questions. So uh, we'll, I want to see lots of questions in the chat box at the end. So looking forward to hearing your questions. So what we're going to cover in this session is the UK Cybersecurity Council's career uh, and learning sections journey so far. And that includes the two key deliverables that we had from the DCMS 2018 consultation. That is the UK Cybersecurity Career Route Map and the UK Cybersecurity Qualification Framework. So just give you a bit of background on that. In 2018, the government launched a consultation outlining proposals to develop the UK cybersecurity profession. And this included a proposal to create a new independent UK Cybersecurity Council. Now, feedback from that consultation included industry comments that you can see here. First, on the cybersecurity landscape, that it was difficult to navigate and difficult to assess career options, and also that many existing professional organizations 
were unable to articulate the equivalences in their qualifications and certifications in the absence of a common technical framework. So those were two key driving features of what we researched and what we eventually came up with. So we got the Council uh, for Mission Project uh, group set up. Uh, as Sam uh, explained earlier, it, it was led by the IET. And one of the key work streams was tasked with uh, these two key deliverables. So uh, one was to create a career framework that would provide information on the career options available in the cybersecurity profession to enable stakeholders to make informed choices. And secondly, a qualification framework to facilitate the navigation of the cybersecurity uh, qualification certification landscape. Now, as we can all, all imagine, you start putting in uh, cybersecurity learning into Google and millions of things comes up. And what we want to do is kind of have that kind of uh, a, a lens to look at everything um, in, in one aspect. So in terms of the actual um, work that we were trying to do, we had to take a step back and say, right, what would be the best way to kind of work, uh, to kind of showcase our work uh, across the other uh, project streams that were going across the, the formation project. So the two products that we actually had, the careers route map and the qualification framework were a part of wide offering of information services that were put forward by the Cybersecurity Council Formation Group. So where the uh, organization would where, so where a stakeholder would actually come to at the end of the day was you know, to literally type something like, how do I begin my career in cybersecurity into Google and up come the Cyber Council website, and then they could easily navigate towards the careers and learning sections and understand and helps it from to demystify what it means to work in cybersecurity. So while we were actually uh, thinking about that kind of journey, we had to think about how would we make it uh, easier for the individual stakeholder that was actually coming to the site, seeking that information and literally putting ourselves in, in their shoes. So we had to uh, come with some uh, guiding principles for the development of our frameworks. And the first element was to try to look at, you know, be completely transparent and create a repeatable process because as you can imagine, the landscape of careers, qualifications and learning is changing over time. So rather than just be a case of, right, it's a one and done thing, it's a case of let's set up a process. So once the project is over and we basically pass over the buck to the um, people that are on this call right now is uh, and, and people like me fade away, they can look back at the documentation and say, okay, right, this is how we come up with the answer. This is the process of follow and they can repeat it for different uh, elements of elements that might change or evolve. The second element that was very keen upon was uh, have a clarity in all communications. And I would al always say, okay, can someone with a GCC in English understand and read this? Um, so it's very important for uh, the information to be quite uh, easily accessible, to be easily readable, and that way it will be available to all the stakeholders. And one of the things that we were also quite uh, keen about is once you look at uh, different elements in cybersecurity, you might have one organization call certain terms in one sort of fashion and another organization call certain terms in a different fashion. So we wanted a consistent lexicon across the board. And where we kind of harnessed that lexicon was through two existing um, frameworks. One was the CYBOC, the Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge, and the CSEC framework. So really uh, marrying those two together to create a consistent terminology across the board. And we weren't alone on this journey. CompTIA was definitely leading it. Uh, and I, I, I was I had the a wonderful A team to help me to get to that uh, uh, final answer. And these were the different organizations that helped us in the, in the formation uh, project and were members of our work stream. As you can see, they are made up of commercial organizations, they're made up of other certification bodies, they're made up of framework organizations, there's some um, um, uh, governmental bodies. So we were all together and that kind of shared vision of trying to create uh, these frameworks that would be able to be harnessed by all. So 
So we're just going to talk a little bit about the career route map and, and where that has got to. Now, this is a quote from the DCMS consultation regarding the brief for, for the uh, career route map. And it, it, it was to uh, develop a framework agreed across the profession, setting out a comprehensive alignment of career pathways through the profession, leading towards a nationally recognized career structure adopted by the whole UK cybersecurity sector. So that was the brief that we were given to, to develop this product. The approach that we took was to examine several existing career skills frameworks in the cybersecurity uh, domain and other domains, as well as to consult representatives of cybersecurity practicing organizations. We also spoke to training providers, professional bodies, and qualification awarding bodies in the research. And we drew on well-established resources to ensure, as Ishan has just described, that we have this repeatable, transparent process to define each of the specialisms. So what has been developed is a framework that provides information on the expectations, skills, and development required for professional specialism, along with details on progression through the different roles. So one of the things that we found through all that research was there was a some complete myths and misconceptions that were being pushed in the profession. So, uh, as you know, it, it was it's very if you look at the imagery on on the um, on the screen here, you would expect uh, when people say, "Hey, you know, it's okay, so let's get into cybersecurity," and it's literally you do A, you do B, and you and you do C, and you're literally going up a staircase and literally getting to the top of your career. Unfortunately, cyber career pathways aren't anything but linear, and, and that's why we had to figure out, okay, what would be the best way to showcase this information? And as you can see on the imagery on the right-hand side, that's exactly was the reality, where there's different routes in, different ways to kind of uh, jump, different specialism, different roles. So we uh, were really trying to understand how can we make this information clearer to new entrants? Because once you look at this kind of spaghetti uh, junction, as it were, you end up causing um, more confusion. So we had to find a really easy way to make it uh, easier for um, our stakeholders to navigate into the, pro into the profession. So our work stream consultations with industry stakeholders um, actually demonstrated uh, that the audience was actually really wide. So we're not really looking at just the people wanting to work in cybersecurity or in cybersecurity actually uh, got uh, much larger than we expected. And to kind of talk to that point, these were different stakeholders that we actually found. So as you can see, you know, we're talking about new entrants, career changes, uh, qualification bodies. We've got uh, different managers, we've got training bodies, we've got regulators, we've got local authorities, we've got teachers, parents and carers. Uh, so it was an absolutely interesting point of like, everyone wanted to know and get and harness some information uh, from our, uh, our products. So this wider, audience actually um, benefited the careers route map because we actually were, were able to uh, uh, draw in what they wanted and to actually uh, tease out uh, elements of the careers route map and there's some supplemental information that is on the careers um, and learning web pages and this allowed uh, a nice little process of kind of building the people into first of all understanding what cybersecurity is, what is a profession, you know, ways to, that they can learn, and then finally get the point, okay, right, so now these are different specialisms. So a nice gentle introduction to before they actually just jump in to say, you know, what do you want to do? Well, first of all, let's get you uh, learning a bit more, find out what you don't know, and then you go and get, find out what you want to know. So in terms of benefits, uh, uh, in terms of the benefits of the career route map, we uh, have uh, detailed information for a range of stakeholders about the 16 professional areas within cybersecurity for not just new entrants, but also recruiters, managers, and the other stakeholders that showed. Uh, and we had alignments of industry specialisms in a consistent structure. And that was a very important point for us. It had to be a consistent structure that any specialism you would see, you would have the same information served up for it. So the, we, the last thing we wanted was have missing content or content that didn't exist. And this was also um, kind of driven by the fact that uh, 
um, as we were uh, working on the, um, the careers framework, what we found was threat intelligence was just up and coming at that point in time. Now it's very much established, but a couple of years ago, not so much. So at that point, there wasn't much information of how that works as a job role and people were still moving to those job roles and those specialisms. And then we had to tease out what that meant. However, what we found by doing a repeatable process, having a templated structure as it were, we were able to uh, uh, help those uh, individuals and the managers and people working in that air sector to kind of take a step back and get and say, oh, actually, yes, that's true now. And they will actually be able to share more information about that section. So why did we end up with 16 specialists? Well, first of all, there were too many different job roles out there, which lack consistency in uh, in description and, and they had various uh, job titles. Uh, specialisms actually demonstrate a principal field of professional activity responsible for practice. So when we were looking at re our research, we found that, you know, people talk about, okay, we wanted people to have really good general cybersecurity skills, which is great. You know, we want people to understand people, process, technology, but then knowing those areas in uh, people, process, technology across the cybersecurity field, what um we actually were te then able to tease out from managers and other stakeholders who were then the case of right where does the buck stop now what is their specialism so, you know yes they know a little bit about everything but do they need to know a bit more about their pension testing or auditing or risk and that then became the element that we were concentrating upon so not only that we are trying to get people who can understand the the various uh elements of cyber security but then they can actually say this is what I'm good at. This is what I do want to do more of. And that allows uh, to have a much more richer career set and a, a much more diverse cybersecurity profession. So the process uh, was long and arduous. I, I love it how we kind of put it out of stage one, two, three. Uh, this is uh, a better part of two years to kind of go, go in and, and create this uh, work. So in terms of the first stage, you know, we relied upon the, the different logos organization that you saw uh, earlier. So those members were part of our, our, our work stream and our working group. And we basically were able to kind of um, bring them in and out uh, on different specialisms because like you imagine some organizations knew certain areas a bit better than others. Uh, we also had a wonderful advisory group uh, for the council that were made up of uh, absolutely uh, fantastic industry experts across you know, um, you know, academia, actually at the call face and people and, and the managers and governance uh, people as well. So we we're able to then get that kind of validation process as we're going through and looking at uh, and as we're making changes to kind of get, okay, is this right now? Are we going the right, right pathway? That was in the, in the stage two, okay. So kind of that kind of closed group that was working on the council. Then, um, so that was stage one. So in stage two, we then moved a bit further out. Uh, we started talking to different academia, so universities, colleges, etc., and then bringing industry experts uh, as well that weren't part of the council project and really showing them the work that we've done so far and getting their, their feedback. These were people that were representing themselves. That might be like you know, guns for hire in the cybersecurity profession. They could be also people within uh, a large and small organizations uh, and doing a job role, or it could be the people guiding teams as well. We talked to government bodies and different NGO stakeholders, and they were also looking at it. Okay, so does this align with what we're already, what they were already doing? And we're not kind of contradicting in their work as well. Uh, we were very keen to talk to professional bodies. Uh, this could be that were te both technical and those that may not, maybe less so, but may have some vested interests in it. So it could be people working more on the engineering side. And um, uh, I think Kiara was earlier talking about IoT and IoT is a great uh, element because yes, we talk about cyber, but we're also talking yeah. about a bit of engineering product development there. So those had a bit of a vested interest in the work that we're doing there. And then finally, we were going and talking to the, the, our, our future professionals and, and, and the people recruiting them. So it's talking to the students. These could be students in, uh, in um, universities or there could be also uh, just recent graduates. And they were able to share what they had learned and how their journey um, had, had taken place. 
uh, we're talking to recruiters for, who are actually uh, getting those people into those job roles and their issues because what they found was when they talked to company A, they would talk about uh, a, a job title, uh, we had a, a certain set of skills, then there's company B with a, a different job title, but it has the same set of skills. So which is it? So we were able to kind of uh, help them to try to demystify uh, what their, their, their work was. And finally, which is a, uh, an element that's cl uh, close to my heart is actually talking to the trainers who were delivering the content to the students, you know, could, they could be students who are uh, young people, uh, new entrants, and also people who were doing second and third careers, so career changes, so more adult learners, and talking to those uh, trainers and think, thinking about, right, what are the challenges that they have and what could they bring into, you know, into the uh, work that we're doing to make it easier for people to understand, you know, do they really want to talk about security testing or it does a heart lie more within risks or governance, etc. So by putting all these different audiences together and going through this uh, process of development and kind of rechecking our homework as it were with these uh, wonderful uh, professionals and, and individuals, we were able to uh, get a nice uh, representation of the industry as a whole. Hey. So that's that's a bit of background to how we got to what we're going to show you now. So now we're going to give you a demonstration of the career route map, starting with the, the landing page. So you come into the council's website and you'll you'll click on the right to get to the careers section. Careers and learning is, is where you'll navigate to and then you'll navigate down to the career route map. And then when you scroll down, you get uh, a little bit of a description of what the, the product is. And then you will see the 16 specialisms. Now, I just want to repeat that these specialisms are the principal field of professional activity, responsibility and practice, not job titles or job roles. And the, the point of this uh, first navigation page is really to give a strong display of the interrelationship between the specialisms. So when you click on one specialism, that specialism will be highlighted. But what you'll also see is you'll see specialisms that have similar characteristics in terms of knowledge and skills. Uh, so before you, you dive in, the, the, the user will note that there are other opportunities to go back and review. So when you click on that specialism, you'll see the learn more uh, button and once navigating to that, click on that and that will take you to all the detail as you scroll down. You'll be able to see the headings, different areas that you can uh, explore. You'll see that uh, pro progression will provide different levels of capability and make distinctions, which will include the NCSC's C CCP model of practitioner and lead. And um, most of the pathways include two, some include three levels of responsibility that uh, potential candidates can look at. You'll see a skills section, which includes a reference to the CSEC skills mapping. And you'll also see a knowledge area. Sorry, I'm going too fast and let you have a look at that. So that is referenced using that particular framework, which is well known. And then the knowledge area will include references to the CYBOC lexicon. We are using CYBOC the knowledge in the qualification framework. And this is all uh, to ensure that there is a consistent approach to the lexicon in the career route map, but also in qualifications that would uh, serve as stepping stones to those individual specialisms. So additional joining information uh, includes um, information, not just for those who are new to the profession, but also you'll see within each category is information for people who are already in that the profession or related professions. So please explain your leisure.
Right. So that was really just a, a, a quick whistle, whistle stop tour. I think that is better done individually and in looking at the areas that you're interested in rather than having us do that in, in a demonstration. And I want to move on to some of the supporting work that we did, which is the qualification framework. So the purpose of the qualification framework is to provide a system of classifying a qualification at different levels for comparability using, I say a consistent lexicon, but it's consistent lexicons. And that is, as we've just discussed, the sidewalk lexicon for knowledge. And at the moment, we're using the SISEC lexicon to describe skills. So that's, that's the intention. And you've seen now how that will link to the career route map. Okay, the stakeholders for this are the same as for the career route map. Uh, although using it in a slightly different way, clearly new entrants will want to see what their stepping stones are. Recruiters and managers will want to look and see when they have candidates, how they can establish equivalencies. Career changers will want to look and see what they can add to their, their learning to be able to undertake new roles. Training organizations will want to have a look at the landscape to see what they might want to add to their training arsenal. Um, and uh, local authorities, regulators will, will want to link that in with their own tracks for their cybersecurity teams. Right, so the guiding principles for this are, first of all, to make it open to all cybersecurity qualifications and certifications, that so everyone has an equal chance of being uh, put through the process of developing this consistent lexicon. And, and having a review. Now, it's not a, a recommendation or an endorsement. The qualification framework is simply a way of translating individual organizations' vocabulary into a similar language that can be understood and, and then applied to the career route map. Um, qualification owners, awarding organizations will have the final say, so the council doesn't make any decisions without an agreement with the awarding organization or owner of that qualification or certification that they, they agree with the translation that that is accurate. Uh, the council has an independent verification process to ensure its ac accuracy using those two lexicons. And there is also a challenge process on equivalencies if there are any queries about that. So the validity and reliability of the methodology is a, is a process as all the processes that, that we've used uh, to, to challenge. Now, in terms of benefits, it, the clear and consistent approach was, is what the, the brief was. Once knowledge and skills outcomes uh, in learning products can be identified against a consistent range of criteria, it makes it much easier for people to compare and select the right product for themselves. So th this clarity uh, of individual cybersecurity planning is intended to be a benefit here. Also, there is support for organizations that are developing cybersecurity recruitment processes to be able to make these comparisons between candidates and, and think about what additional learning their own workers might need to, um, to meet their role objectives. Developers of products will want to have a look at the landscape and see what products they wear and whether there's any new and emerging areas of knowledge and skills that are missing and can be added to new or existing certifications and qualifications. And also um, trade organizations will benefit from using this in similar way. Finally, uh, this can be a reference scheme for uh, other products such as cyber essentials where individuals need to present certifications and show a predetermined list and also some uh, some other opportunities to do that within their organizations. So the approach to the mapping is to use a form where qualification and certification owners complete their information. This is modeled loosely on uh, the Department for Education's RQF evaluation framework when they're listing qualifications at secondary. It's very simple format uh, where information is put in, the difference being the, the single lexicon of the CSEC and CYBOC uh, references for the knowledge and skills. So you can see here just part of the form 
uh, and these are all of the entries that I think you would expect to see when you're reporting on a product in terms of the title and the reference to that, uh, the owner contact information, type of learning product it is, the specialist subject area, which we give the owner a chance to refer to the specialisms and make a judgment on where they think that fits, which will be subject to uh, agreement. Learning outcomes need to be included. The knowledge areas covered using the sidewalk lexicon and there's some mapping information, detailed mapping information, which is available to support the organization in mapping their technical syllabi or exam syllabi. That's what we're looking at. We're, we're not looking at the overall syllabi. We're looking at how success is judged, how an awarding organization would say that this person has succeeded in this particular product. The skills and competencies, as I've mentioned, are using the, the SISEC lexicon. There's a section on levels, total learning time, delivery methods, assessment methods, and uh, a link to the product website. So that, that's what the form contains, and that's what we're asking awarding organizations to fill in. Now that information will translate into a one page display. And this is really where the council is gonna add a tremendous amount of value to the industry, because for the first time you will be able to look at a very wide range of different products and have the information listed in a consistent way. You'll be able to look at a bar chart or similar. We haven't, this isn't the final view, but this is an example of what that one page display might look like a shorthand form for all of the stakeholders that we've been discussing how they might be able to begin to make comparisons between the knowledge and skills there will also be a link to the product owner's website so they can get uh, additional detail so i just want to have one slide one discussion about what the current process is in the council for reviewing qualifications and the route to the um, career route map. I'll just show you some operational processes that we're working on at the moment. So once an awarding organization submits a uh, certification, the map certification using that form that we've just looked at, that will go to a validation panel. One, one person on that panel will then cross check the entries against the CYBOC mapping and the CSEC mapping, just to confirm that the entries are there in the percentages that have been uh, entered. That will then go into the council's qualification framework database, and that will generate the one page display along the lines of what we just looked at, although that's not the final version. At the same time, once the qualification framework has been validated, that will then go to a career route map committee who will look at the uh, the contents of that and uh, a judgment will be made on which specialisms that uh, product best applies to as the stepping stone towards that particular specialism so we're not going to take questions now so i apologize for that i think we're going to take those at the end I think just leads me to say thank you very much. I look forward to any comments or, or questions that you may have at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Amy and Zeshan. And yes, we will indeed be taking questions um, during our Q&A session um, shortly. So if you do have any uh, questions for Amy and Zeshan, please put them through on the uh, chat function and we will put those questions to them as part of our Q&A session. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Paul Dawson Hart and Brian Lilly from the UK Cybersecurity Council, who will be talking about the work being done to date on cyber standards. Welcome, Paul and Brian. Hello. So I, I think I'll, I'll kick off then. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time to listen to the presentation today uh, from Brian and myself. Uh, we'll sort of take turns in terms of the slide deck. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm the Programme Manager of Professional and Ethical Standards here at the Council. Um, I joined the Council about five months ago. And um, this isn't about me, but I'll, I'll reference me as it relates to the presentation. We're going to start talking later about the breadth and depth of knowledge 
uh, for competence and uh, and uh, experience later. Uh, I'd say mine is fairly narrow and shallow in terms of uh, cybersecurity. I've had about four years experience prior to this sort of project managing cyber essentials and ISO 27001 in the membership space. And I suppose that's relevant because I sort of represent some of the professionals who are coming into the profession at the sort of latter, well, rather later uh, stages in their uh, in their careers. Um, also, presently halfway through a master's degree in cybersecurity, I'm not going to tell you where, but it's interesting how some of the programs of work at the council relate directly to that, to making informed choices about that. And um, I'm not entirely sure that, uh, that, that I did, if we think about things around NCSE approved degrees, etc. So I'm really keen to avoid uh, death by PowerPoint here, and I know everyone says that, and then you suddenly find yourself dizzy with fly-ins and animations or simply asleep, but I've tried to keep this as succinct as possible, and we can get into the detail uh, uh, later in the questions, although I may have to divert to Brian for some of the information history. So Brian is the technical strategic lead for the council, and as I said, he was involved in the formation team working on the creation of the standard for professional competence and commitment, and he can provide some great insights into work up to the go live of the council and, sh and, and, and since. Uh, I think, Brian, you'll do the intro later as part of your uh, as, as slides. So first of all, the opening slide, the cornerstone. Well, what do we mean by that? So today, what we'd like to talk about is how we start to underpin and provide foundations to the profession, how we can provide uh, confidence to those in the profession, those who recruit from the profession and give confidence to the wider society that the UK is a safe place to be online. So as the first slide says, putting standards together is really that cornerstone upon which we can have confidence in ourselves and get to a position where cybersecurity is baked in by, uh, by design and default rather than an afterthought or an added extra. So first slide, we're going to go back in time a little bit and uh, Googling big events of 2016, I came up with the election of Donald Trump and the launch of Alexa. So I've gone with the latter, uh, but it was also the launch of the national cybersecurity strategy. And out of that, there were some really interesting statements that are now up on this slide. Uh, I'm not going to parrot these, but what we're really trying to illustrate is not that professionals are not up to the job, but that across society, there is a lack of understanding of what is needed and it's really clear that government has a role here and can help drive, support and define what good cybersecurity looks like, as well as changing, changing of behaviour. It's also clear that this is a long journey. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. I was going to use another example there, but I won't. Uh, and in many professions, this journey took decades or even many terms of office. But we don't have that luxury as a council. And that's why it's important that, uh, that we are adaptive and responsive and hate the word, but agile, and, and we have the support of the profession. But, and it's a very big but, it's not just the government's role here. As an independent body and the voice of the profession, we need to ensure that the whole sector and profession partner and help to deliver this rise in cybersecurity standards across the UK. And that we're proud as, uh, of that standard, as you can see in other professions, such as engineering or science and so on and so forth. So, slide... Next slide. Okay. So jumping forward to 2018 and the Tokyo Olympics, I've drawn out again some key points from the government response to the public consultation. Firstly, and linking into the presentation previous, it's clear there is a lack of clarity around the equivalence of qualifications and certifications in the absence of a common framework. And some really interesting and welcome stats were that 73% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed to the objectives for professional standards and 82% even more to a code of ethics. So it's essential in a profession where ethical challenges can emerge and a guiding code is therefore imperative for anyone trying to navigate those, those conflicts. And it's key that this code is, uh, is refreshed and we continue to redraw boundaries you know, into the future. There's no hierarchy of specialisms across the sector. Uh, there has to be a common standard across them all, but with varying, varying applications to reflect the nuances of the specialism and the attributes required. So, into slide four. Uh, National Cyber uh, uh, Strategy, 2022. Uh, so we're sort of skipping through a pandemic, entering a potential global conflict and sort of horizon scanning for a a plague of locusts, but uh, we've got the National Cyber Strategy 2022, 
And we have a slightly contentious stat that with 82% of respondents saying that the regulation, namely GDPR, or as it's now known, UK GDPR, was an influence in improving cybersecurity. I'm sure there are lots of opinions uh, around that, but as someone who was a consultant dealing with GDPR, I'll probably uh, not share mine. But um, but essentially, what I, what, what we can do is is focus in on, on some really important things, which is I can talk through the Royal Charter underpinning the Council. That's now signed. It's awaiting seal. Um, homeworking has somewhat delayed this, but there's an incredibly powerful update and allows the profession to stand tall and sit as equals to other charter professions and to be pr proud in that charter st status once achieved. The last point here is around the exploration of government levers, including legislation to embed professional standards across the profession. So, the, so this was talked about earlier in the week, uh, but it's also how government uh, buys services in addition to that. So an example being Cyber Essentials, as I talked about earlier, or Cyber Essentials Plus, and ensuring that in order to even be considered in government procurement frameworks, you must have these in order to bid for the work. So this is where it starts, and then hopefully that generates waves that encourage uptake of the standard as it ripples out into other sectors. Okay, so DCMS Open Consultation 2022. So as a reminder to everyone, or at least as it relates to the professional standards, there's, there's now a desire to achieve a plan which is clear and understood, and a plan to effectively empower the council and to formalize its role as, as the standard setter for cybersecurity across the whole of the UK, and also a, a leader across the world. So to do this, we need to ensure that the pipeline is rich with a diverse range of people with the right skills and competencies. And we need to ensure that we are attractive as a profession. And it's fascinating to see what's happening with sort of gamifying of recruitment strategies and advertising computer, computer games and potentially the metaverse and the like. But that's a, another big but. We need to do this in a way that, that does not uh, insert unnecessary boundaries of entry. So we need to get a fair price point for application and regist registration. We need to ensure it's not another expensive piece of paper. And we need to ensure that communities such as the neurodiverse community are considered, particularly when we talk about requirements around communication skills and so forth. So here are some proposals as they relate to standards. Uh, there's a commitment to align the government cyber profession with frameworks built and maintained by the council. There's a discovery exercise around the tra transfer of relevant suitable, suitable is important there, government standards from the government to the UK cybersecurity standards uh, uh, council, technical standards such as were mentioned before uh, from the NCSE, and to send a clear signal um, to formalize the council as a standard setter via approval of those professional and ethical standards. So this is setting out that we're to be the central voice and to help professionals understand what they can do. And of course, the limitations of what they can't. Challenges and um, we've covered some of these in the preceding slides, um, but I think it's worth repeating and reinforcing what this is about so that we know what success looks like. Uh, immediately, something that sticks out for me is the need for the standards to be on this slide, for the standards to be sustainable, adaptive and responsive. They're not fixed standards. They're not like a, a standard for a vault or a kilogram or a chemical standard. Uh, like any framework or policy, if you leave them on a, a dusty shelf or hidden away in a SharePoint, their usefulness weakens over time until they became, become completely irrelevant. Facts, exploiting and IoT spring to mind. And the last point on inclusivity is key. We need to introduce professionalism from the absolute outset of a practitioner's career. We need to foster early commitment of ethical principles. And uh, Brian, I think you have a, a good challenge you can add to this slide that you might add later around or mention around hunting for unicorns. So the next slide. I'm not going to read out and parrot what you can easily read here yourself, but the key words for me are that we maintain these standards, we make them relevant by ongoing input from you and from as wide a range of practitioners from all specialisms, countries, verticals and types of organisation. Again, repeating the point, they're not fixed standards as you can see around, around the slide. They're not a kilogram or a chemical standard, but we need your help, we need your support and we need your contribution to ensure that this happens and they maintain relevance. 
So we've made a good start. The standard has an input from a, a wide range of audiences, and I've been told of an audience member who has a question around that later, so we can expand on that later. But we're grateful for the input so far from the likes of the NCC, Legal in General, Yorkshire Water, MOD, that was mentioned earlier, uh, Cabinet Office, and a raft of professional associations. We're also helpful, or hopeful rather, that input will continue because it's essential that we continue to talk and speak for the Council. So at this point, I believe it's my time to hand over to Brian Lilly, who will talk through the next three, possibly four slides. OK, thank you, Paul. So as, as Paul says, in developing a standard, it's quite important to, I guess, to look at what's around there before you before, out there before you actually put one together. So as part of the project where the, the, the project that was here before the council was set up, we looked at a number of areas. So we looked at things like NICE, we looked at other professions like accountancy, like law, like engineering, to look at how we could build a standard for, this, for, for cyber that was A, relevant, and B, could be changed and moved with the needs of not only the profession, but actually the market for the profession and the ecosystem. So we looked at a number of models and what we finally developed was a standard that aligns quite closely, I guess, to other professions. It, but what we didn't want to do was build it in isolation from where, pe from where people are today. So what we looked at was how other bodies that exist within the cyber ecosystem actually relate to that standard and how they fit and how they do it. Because what we didn't want to do was create a system where people had to change. Like, so they had a choice, I guess, of where they, where they could be. So if, if you wanted to be in an organization that represented you as a penetration tester, you could stay in that organization and still get professional registration. If you were a risk specialist, you could stay in that particular organization. Or if you wanted to move, you could you could move. So we were trying to be as flexible as possible, I guess. The other thing that we were all keen on when we looked at this was continued professional development. We wanted to ensure that not only didn't the standards stay still, but actually neither did the people. So it wasn't good enough, we decided, just that you could, at a point in time, say I'm a competent cyber professional, you have to you have to keep that up. So not only would you have to demonstrate knowledge, would you have to demonstrate that ability to apply knowledge, and, a, and just as importantly, actually, a route to applying that knowledge. So you would have to be in, an, in, a, in a role that allowed you to practice. We then looked at and another important aspect, which is not to just to be, I guess, elitist about this, but to make sure that different roles, different stages of a career were all represented within that standard. So we decided to make it multi-level. And the idea being that at, diff at different roles and different, and different stages of your career, you have the possibility to to apply and have and have and be registered at a particular level. So in common with other professions, envisage with the highest level would be chartered and then closely supported with principal as, as associates. So that actually you can compare yourself with your peers. You can look and be aspirational, but you can also get recognition for what you're doing now. And we felt all of those aspects were really important. And of course, with any profession, it wasn't just about having high knowledge that is that is important. It's it's also the ability to understand other areas of application, both within and outside of the cyber profession. And that ability to communicate was also incredibly important. So by then, if I get you to move on to the next slide, Paul. If we then look at one of the examples of this, so what we did is we tried to create a framework that basically communicated what you would need at a high level for each of these levels. 
And the one I've got on the slide here is about knowledge. And the work of the council now is actually concentrating on looking at how we take this high level framework and turn it into something that can be applied to each of the specialisms. So as Amy mentioned earlier on, there are 16 specialisms. So we're looking at how you can apply this top level framework in detail to each of the specialisms. So that, and I guess one of the key aims of the council, and Paul mentioned this earlier, is to ensure that actually there's a there's an equality between them. So chartered penetrate if you're chartered in a penetration as a penetration tester, your no your your level is the same as someone who's chartered as a risk specialist or a generalist, but your your knowledge and application is different and recognized. We move to the next slide, Paul. So I think, you know, as I just mentioned, the, the, the elements of this are, are generic, but actually is how you apply it and how we assess people, how, how we award it and how we maintain it is what's, going to, is what's going to be key to this. I think it's also important that we're as inclusive as possible. We ensure that people join and that we also, I guess, ensure that in the last point on that slide is that this doesn't stand still. So we'll be continually reviewing the specialisms that we have within the council to see if they're relevant to where today's and actually tomorrow's marketplace is likely to go. We'll be looking at how, uh, how we may look at applying this into potentially, and I know there was a session yesterday on looking at regulation in the cyber market, potentially how this type of professional registration leads into a it could play into a regulated market, et cetera, et cetera. And if we move on to the next slide, Paul. And I think this is now back to you. And you're on mute. Apologies, sorry. So, so, so we get into competence and commit, commitment here, and so what do we mean by um, commitment? Uh, so we mean uh, commitment in terms of personal and professional commitment. We mean maintaining a set of values and, and conduct that, that, that maintains your own reputation in the profession. But importantly, we're talking about a sort of holistic and, uh, and transparent view of competence with underpinning knowledge in the areas that Brian's just mentioned. Uh, experience within a specialism, communication and interpersonal skills, and we need to be careful there, as I alluded to earlier, integrity and collaborative leadership and mentoring. So the next area we're going to talk about is ethics. Uh, it's one of the foundation stones to ensure individuals have a clear framework and guiding principles to, to exercise professional judgment. So the council has produced a code and that code was produced with wide input across a number of bodies in the sector and outside of the sector. And this is about what it means to be um, to, uh, to be an ethical cybersecurity professional, how you demonstrate commitment to ethical values in the workplace, and how as a council we can ensure that there is consistency and fairness in how that code is applied, but that it's applied robustly and how real, with real consequence. So the council will be the independent uh, sort of le a leader in this re regard, and we hope to be sort of trusted as that thought leader for ethical values across the sector. We've got a, a standalone committee of professional ethics because although it's a vital thread in the professional registration process, there is a requirement to, and there's a requirement to demonstrate commitment to this. Uh, we need to cast the net wider and think about how we impact and influence outside of registrants or members of the council, but impact and influence across the entire sector. So I'm talking about a real sort of carrot and stick approach. And, and, and that's a challenge. And so part of the work of the ethics stream who set up the council was to produce a number of case studies uh, or, or worked examples to look at how practitioners uh, deal with and react to, respond to ethical challenges and what best practice would be for that example. So digital forensics has many, many examples here, but there are also cases where the cost of vulnerability to be patched creates tension or pressure from SMT, from the senior management teams, to ignore, to delay remedial action, 
uh, and, the, and the professional might there also be after looking to personal devices under dubious instructions from the CEO, let's say. So the list of work examples will continue to grow at pace as the ethics committee meets with, with and there will be clear community challenge around this. Now, the benefits, what, the what's in it for me? Well, as an employer, it demonstrates an employer's commitment uh, to provide a safe working cyber environment, cyber working environment. It demonstrates commitment to high standards and it could enhance an employer's competitive edge. For organizations, there can be transparency that the consultants they pay for, that the charge that their rates are well qualified, technically competent, up to date cybersecurity expertise, and knowledge that, that, that meets and matches their business needs. And that those practitioners that possess personal integrity and have professional attributes and academic qualifications, they're committed via demonstrable CPD. So the next slide is uh, for, the, for practitioners. So I'm going to pick words out of the wall here. So this is what they, or perhaps you, uh, can, can, can now demonstrate, as well as what they and perhaps you can, can gain. And those are things around confidence and assurance to employers, clients, and the public, credibility with peers, uh, with improved uh, career prospects and employability, proof that your professional skills have been acquired in a work-based environment with critical awareness, that you're equipped with valuable skills that enhance your CV for career progression and employability, and of course, the important bit increased earning potential. And you can demonstrate that you're working to achieve the cybersecurity needs of today and the aspirations of tomorrow. And that we, you could have a guarantee of the individual's commitment to professional standards, such as the Council's Code of Conduct and Practice and Ethics, and we just talked about that. And it proves your ongoing commitment to continuous professional development to ensure that um, your, your, comp, your, your, your expertise and competence evolves and is up to date and, and relevant, and that that competence is rigorously peer reviewed. It indicates that experience and expertise in the individual's chosen specialism in cybersecurity is to a nationally recognized standard of competence. And what else? Well, the last one, it demonstrates that you belong to a network of cybersecurity specialists, which is respected and holds prestige. So the next and last slide, which is my favorite, because this is more re relevant to a lot of the work that I've been working on since joining the council. So we've now got working groups set up for professional standards and they're meeting weekly. There's only five in, in, in the working group at the moment, but this is going to rise to 10 in May or June, and then 15 as they migrate into formal committees. And we've got some real great diversity of thought in that group from regulators, academia, professional bodies, SMEs, and it's UK wide. So we've got a lead in the first five, five from Cyber Northern Ireland. And as we increase again, and as I said, that will be in May and June, we'd love to have input and influence and leadership from Scotland as well. The, the council's got a digital HQ and staff and governance figures are based in Wales and Northern Ireland and England and I think Jamaica perhaps. Uh, so we're not London centric and that was with a key focus of mine when reviewing the invitations. We have a technical advisory panel which has been set up to review, monitor and ensure consistency across the specialisms and the, that were defined by the formation team. But as Brian mentioned, these specialisms are going to evolve over time. They're not fixed and, and nor could they be. So we're looking forward to the uh, next phase of the council, which is even more input, more in collaboration from as big and as wide a tent as, as, as possible and feasible. So the Royal Charter, it's here, it's signed in vellum, slightly delayed as I mentioned earlier, uh, but we have this now. It's real, it's tangible, and it's, and it's really important. And that concludes the presentation. I think we're over to questions uh, from the audience. Lovely. Thank you both so much, Paul and Brian. Um, and I will be um, putting questions um, to all participants um, in today's event um, to you shortly. So I'll be starting off with a question that's come in that says, there appears to be quite a bit of overlap between Cyber Scotland and the Council, and it'd be good to know what plan both organisations have and will they be actively working um, together to develop the profession? Um, certainly, I know from yesterday's um, event that that's the case. Um, I don't know if um, anybody from the council perspective wants to just do a quick um, response to that. 
Okay, I think the short answer to that is yes, we will be working together. And I, I think the, the council has a particular remit, which is about professionalization and being, and being the voice of the profession. Now, naturally that tends to bleed into other areas because the council does have opinion on, opinions on things. But I think it's quite important to recognize that the council has been set up for a specific job and, and a specific remit. And I think it's also important to recognize that it's UK wide so that it is important that we deal with England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and that we represent each of those facets in a way that that is beneficial to all. And so I guess our aim is to work with all parties and to ensure that the standards that we create and the qualifications frameworks and career frameworks that we produce are truly representative of the profession and meet the needs of the of the UK cyber strategy, which is to make the UK a safe place to do business. Lovely, thank you, Brian. Um, the next question um, that we have, and this is to um, all the panels, so I'll come to um, each of you in turn. Um, will the qualifications framework include degrees and other qualifications such as BTEC and T levels? And will there be work to support people entering the profession um, via apprenticeships? Um, so Amy, if I can come to you first on, on that one, please. Thank you. Yes, is the, the short answer. That is the intention uh, in the longer term. We're just starting with this. It's very, very important that we get the foundations right in terms of the lexicon, the skills, the equivalencies. So we are testing it initially with uh, certifications. We will then move on once that is established to, to other products to meet the brief. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Session, I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Yeah, it's it's it's, a, it's it's one of the things that you know um, we're trying to do when we're we're building out um, our, our process right at the beginning during the project. Um, you know, like like Amy says, short answers yes, but the main element that we found was uh, to kind of focus on the certification piece because that's where the most confusion lied. Um, as you as um, it's previously noted, there is already NCSC certified degrees. Uh, at the NCSC are doing lots of work in the cyber first arena as well. So we would just felt that it was best to kind of focus on an, an area that is that most professionals are knocking on the door for. And then once that's um, that is, is tried, tested, it can be applied to other areas. Lovely, thank you. Um, next question that's um, come in is, the consultation mentions that there will be statutory regulation by professional title. Um, what titles will be um, regulated? Um, Paul and Brian, can I come to you on that one, please? Brian, you're on mute. Brian, we, you're on mute. Okay, then just to start on that then. I think it's important to realize that the consultation is exactly that, a consultation. And it's about looking at the potential of statutory regulation. So I think what, what the council is doing at the moment is ensuring that as we move forward, that our, our titles are defined in such a way that it would be possible to regulate by those professional titles but we're not explicitly, I guess, looking to work in a regulated environment because we believe passionately that the titles will work in an unregulated or regulated market. And we're basically trying to, we're covering both bases at the moment. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you need to add to that at all? I do that. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, as, as as Brian says, this is very much a consultation. We're not, you know, they're mm -hmm. looking at sort of soft touch options for for, for levers to to formalise what we're trying to achieve. Um, so at the moment, it's 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 a consultation, and the questions should come off the back of that. 
Amy, did you want to add to that? Did I hear you come in there? Yeah, sorry, I was, go I was going to jump in there to, to just second. There are two <laughs> consultations, and, and one of them is in fact on what, if any, regulation will help drive up cyber resilience. So, so that is a question for cyber resilience. Okay, thank you. And, and um, support for cyber resilience. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next question that's come in is, how does, how does the standard relate to the qualifications framework? Um, so, Brian and, and Paul, if I can come to you first and then Amy and Zeshan. I think it, it would be useful for, for uh, Brian as part of the formation team and, 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 and Amy as part of the formation team, perhaps to talk about how they interlinked and, and, and wove these two areas together as work streams within the formation team. Okay, so I, I guess at the minute is the, the, the qualifications framework and the standard is best described as loosely linked. And what, what the council is keen to do is walk before we can run. But what we but if you look at other professions, what happens over time is that the qualifications framework, as we achieve some of the aims that Zeshan and Amy talked about in being able to not only advertise but assess these qualifications, is that you can link them to the knowledge requirements in the in the competency framework that I described. So you, you, over time, you get a harder link. But I think at the minute is that it's a, it's a journey and we can see the end game, but it isn't going to happen in, in six months. I think we're measuring in years rather than months. And I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, Amy. Shall I jump in there to, to add to that? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, um, uh, Carla, to, to answer your question, there are different ends of the spectrum. The qualification framework evaluating what a candidate is expected to achieve in order to pass that qualification. So it's really looking at and evaluating the contents of the assessment of the qualification, whereas the standards are, are assessing what the individual has. So there are... Uh, the, the necessary ingredients at the, the bottom end and the top end to, to reach the whole, if, if that explains it. Hey, thank you. Uh, next question from our audience is, as you develop the standards, who will be involved or consulted? Are you consulting with professionals that are currently practicing? And have you been working with organisations within cyber to, to date? Okay, so maybe um, I should start with the historical yeah. stuff and then hand on to Paul to describe what we're doing now. Yeah. So historically, when we were in the setup project, what we did was we set up a working group, and that working group consisted of cyber professionals, of which I was one. And I guess one of the things I missed when I did the presentation is do the quick intro. You know, I've been in this doing this for over 30 years now and cyber as a term wasn't even invented when when i when i started it when i started but i think it's important that we do consult so what we did we had a working group we then went wider within the project and i from memory i think there was 14 organizations within the alliance of different different organizations from professional bodies to organizations offering offering cyber training to organizations that offer qualifications and certification to organizations that were consumers and providers of cyber. So we did that. And then the third stage is we went at the community challenge. So we took this and asked the wider community what they thought and pulled all those comments together to produce this. So we produced as wide a possible standard to hand over the, to the council to start their work. And this is where I hand over to Paul to describe the process that he is now following to build upon that work that we did, that we did in the set of project. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'd really repeat what I said in the presentation, which is that we've got this initial group of five on the working group that will build and formalise and migrate to be a committee of 10 and then 15. It's a key focus of mine to ensure that there's diversity of thought on that uh, on that committee. Mm -hmm. So as I said, uh, uh, mentioned earlier, one of the uh, initial five is Simon Whitaker rep representing vertical uh, uh, structure uh, based in Northern Ireland, representing a, a, the, the SME sector, the, the practitioners, micro businesses, you know, very strongly coming from that angle. Um, the best way you can influence uh, and, and, be, uh, you know, and be involved in this, of course, is to is to join as a member of the council. Uh, but even if even if you don't do that, these working groups and committees aren't going to be working in isolation. We want to have as big and as broad as wide a church as possible. So we'll be engaging uh, via community challenge. Uh, lots of, you know, in terms of the work that the committees are looking at and professional standards and the developing of those standards, pushing that out and getting some really good feedback and input from as wider, uh, you know, a community as possible across all countries of the UK. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, next question that's come in is, alongside Cyber Essentials CCP aligning their requirements with any professional standards set by the council, I'm assuming that other professional individual cyber certifications, um, CompTIA, for example, would also likely align too. And how would the council monitor this? Going forward, it's important that cyber professionals are aware of how their CPD aligns to their membership. Um, Zesha, may I come to you first as CompTIA is uh, specifically mentioned in this question? <laughs> well, it's more a question about standards, isn't it, realistically? Yeah. So, uh, look, um, it's, you know, we, we've, we've, we're working closely with the council. We, you know, we are uh, super champions for it. Uh, uh, we're really working on a project coming up very soon as well that we're going to be working with the council with. So ideally, the, the you know, not just us, but the different circuit boys out there are going to be looking at what the council does and then say, okay, right, what are we doing to uh, support professionals and be a best possible fit? The unfortunate fact is that it's the UK Cyber Security Council and where is an international body so we have to be uh, valid for not just what happens in the uk but what happens in america what happens in australia what happens in japan and er everywhere in between sort of things so we just have to be very careful all our approaches but you now you know as we have done in the past we, you know we've aligned ourselves with cyborg we've aligned ourselves with uh the nice framework and the sophia framework uh, you name the framework, we'll probably we've aligned some kind of mapping towards it. So no doubt we will do so. But uh, no, that's half the answer. So I think the other half kind of lies with Brian or, or, or Paul there. Okay, so I, I think, as I said earlier on, is that qualifications mm -hmm. and certifications pre perform part of the knowledge and competence that people demonstrate within our standards. And I think as, as we as we as we move forward, that linkage will become tighter and tighter. But um, we we obviously are working, as you can see, with Zeshan here, and there are others in in working across there to ensure that we that we do it step by step. And although we are the UK Cybersecurity Council, like Zeshan, I agree because of the nature of cyber, it always has an international dimension. So we are, we are conscious of what is happening with, an, with a nice framework, with what's happening in things like NIST and what, what we're looking at at a crossing, as I said, in Australia earlier on and, th and throughout the world, because what we want to do is ensure that the UK is, a, is, a, is on the leading edge of this, but actually it's something that's workable and, move, and moves the profession forward as well. Do you have anything to add, Paul? Um, no, no. I just say that you know any any exploratory work to uh, align CCP, for example, with the professional stands of the council will be done, you know, carefully uh, with with risk in mind. You know, looking you know, holistically at um, what that would look like um, it, for, for for the whole profession, and we'll engage the profession in that process via working groups, via committees, via community challenge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, we can't do this alone. You know, we're a small organisation. We, we need the help of the profession in order to move this forward. And we need the profession to be on board to move this forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Paula. Just to echo that from my perspective, that we um,
Internet of Things operate. Um, considered. Um, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Because one of our, um, you saw in the process of who we consulted, we actually had a representative of the Office for Nuclear Regulation. Uh, who basically has had two hats on. One, he served as our technical reviewer in terms of before we put, push anything out to community challenge. Uh, sure it was great. Oh, the ICS. So yes, definitely had that as part of our process and tried to weave it in. Uh, we ended up weaving it in in different areas, but I think the main area where it starts to talk about security by design, secure by design and whatnot, is within the specialism of secure system development. So definitely check that one out. Uh, that's what we included. So, yep, the, the, uh, topic that's very close to my heart. Uh, good, good that gentleman uh, is, a, is a old colleague and friend. So, yeah, we definitely would do that. However, look, as far as I see the careers route map, how we see the, um, the standards, the qualification framework, etc., it will keep on evolving, and there will be things that will you know coming in and other things fading away. So uh, it may not feel like it's you know as you know things get more of a spotlight on it as the uh, the profession grows, as the job role specialism grows. That means there could be an IoT or uh, or OT specialism in the future. Who knows? But now, uh, but the short answer is yes. If I if I can just add on the on the area of, of specialisms, so when when we were, when we actually defined the specialisms again, the, the this subject came up, and it wasn't the only one. Things like cloud security came up as well. How do you line those into specialisms? Now we took the decision when we did that at the time across again similar in thing to what I said about how we how we how we did the standard. We did exactly the same with the specialisms. We went through exactly the same thing with community challenge was do we do it technology based or do we do it based on, on knowledge areas? And we decided it, it was better to do on knowledge, but also recognizing, and as I said earlier on, that we're quite likely to flex and change the specialisms as we move forward. And as Paul said, in consultation and in association with all you guys as part of the profession, because what we what we don't want to be, I guess, is someone who the council is dictating from the top. We want the the profession to be involved and be part of this and move it forward for all of us. Thank you, Brian. Um, Paul or Amy, do you have anything to add before I move on to the next question? No, thank you. I think that thank covers you. it. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Okay. Um, final question um, that we have in from our audience, unless there's any more um, that any of you would like to submit. Uh, will the council be issuing the chartered status to professionals and what are the timelines associated? Okay, so I, I think the answer is yeah. The, 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 the way we envisage, which is what Paul, if you remember, talked about in his presentation, is that we will actually license other bodies to do the chartering process. We will set the standard as the council on what it means to be and, and to attain that. Uh, and what we're doing at the minute is A, we're waiting for the, the Royal Charter to appear on vellum because we can't do anything until that happens. And secondly, we're busy working out how we go from today to actually running the a, the chartered system and also principal and associate because we're very keen that we do all three levels at once so that we're as inclusive as possible. So we're busy looking at it at the minute. So I'd say watch that space for some announcements about timescales and the way forward, but not to give too much away of our current thinking, but is that we're thinking that we're probably going to do this in a stage way because 
it is go- I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to go from zero to perfection in one jump. So what we're going to do is try and do it in small steps. So we bring people on and get as much input, input as possible so that as we move along this journey, we try and make it as smooth as we possibly can. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, Paul or Amy, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Okay. No, nope, thank you. Okay. Paul, you're on mute. Sorry, it's a, 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 a bad habit. I don't seem to get out. I'll be able to get out of. So I'll, I'll just simply repeat uh, uh, some of the stuff I said in the, in the in the presentation, which is that we will hold the register uh, for, 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 for chartered status and um, and provide access to that, you know, a secure access, of course, uh, for employees and uh, in, in, employers. Um, I'm reluctant to give any kind of indicative date because we've already had 12 months of working from home at the Crown. Um, in, in, in the offices and that's created delays and and now I would suggest with what's going on internationally it might not be at the top of priorities but we're certainly talking months um, you know it's you know in, in a sort of season but as Brian points out it's, in, it's important that we take small steps here and recognize that what we're trying to achieve is something that's been done in other professions over over decades um, and so that really needs you know some some important risk management and um, and to be clear about sort of setting expectations i would say okay thank you very much paul um so that concludes um our event and q a um session today um i hope you've um all enjoyed it uh thank you everyone for attending um for sharing your your questions and huge thanks to our speakers simon hefburn kira mitchell amy rogers paul dawson hart Sessions, Sesson Shatter and Brian Lilly. Um, apologies that Simon and Kiara couldn't stay for the Q&A, but if you have any other questions or comments or anything that you'd like to send in to us, please do so via the inquiries at ukcybersecuritycouncil.org.uk um, email address, and we'll be delighted to um, answer them. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the consultation is underway until the 20th of March. Um, so we do urge you all to um, send in your responses formally um, to the uh, consultation um, before that, that date um, comes around. Um, and we have some more virtual roadshow events coming up next week with Cyber Wales and the following week um, for England. And please check our website for further details um, of these. We also have two additional events coming up at the Council, um, one for International Women's Day on 8th of March at 9.30, which will focus on decrypting the cybersecurity industry's glass ceiling with keynote speakers, Lindy Cameron, CEO of the NCSC and others, and that's shaping up to be a really, really uh, first class event. And we have um, taking the lead, ensuring London has the world class cyber skills it needs in partnership with City University London, and that's the 10th of March at nine o'clock a.m. And again, all the details for those are on our website. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you all again for attending and enjoy the uh, rest of your day. <laughs>